I'm sorry if you you're sorry if we're not able to, to live stream every time. Sometimes we have technical difficulties. Uh, sometimes I forget to plug in the the attachment that makes the live stream work, and sometimes microphones get let off and things like that. But eventually, we'll have it 100% of the time, unless the internet is just not working. <laughs> so uh, we're trying to get that working consistently, but just be patient with us as we do that. Today, uh, we're going to talk about a text in the Bible that is difficult, but it's not difficult for the reason that you might think that it's difficult. It's not difficult because the words are hard to understand or hard to comprehend, but instead the passage is difficult because generally we as Christians, and I'm not speaking as any specific person, but just as a whole, Christians aren't the best students when it comes to the Old Testament. And because of our lack of understanding of the Old Testament, sometimes we come across words or phrases in the New Testament that trip us up because we're not familiar with them as we are with the Old Testament. Consider for a moment, uh, whenever you're talking about, if you're a sports fan, when you're talking about sports with somebody, particularly football, and you hear them talking about, uh, you know, a, uh, you hear them talking about the center and the, and the tackles and the guards and things like that, and, you know, they do, was it the hook and run, right? Or, you know, whatever, the uh, play action pass and all that, you know, you're good to go. Or hitch and go is what I meant to say. Hitch and go is what, you know, the, where, they, where they fake like they're going to run back and then they head off down the field and they catch a long pass for a touchdown and everybody's happy. Well, when you're talking about those events and you're using those phrases like hitch and go and linebacker and all these things, extra point, well, those make sense to you because they're within the context of your life. You're familiar with those words. You're familiar with how they're used. But when you get somebody who's familiar with soccer as opposed to football, they've never watched American football before, here they are talking about soccer, and you're talking about football, and now the terms are all confused because your football and their football isn't the same football. You're, you call yours a pigskin, and they wonder what in the world does that even mean. And so what I'm trying to illustrate to you is that in certain cultures, um, some people have an instant recognition of what a word or phrase means, and they got no problem with comprehending it. But whenever you're separated from that culture, and you're not constantly every day being exposed to the way that this language is used, it's going to catch you by surprise, and it may lead you to misinterpret it. The young man who wants to go play soccer uh, is disappointed when he shows up to the football game and everybody's wearing full pads and running each other over, right? Counterwise, whenever the man shows up with, with pads and a helmet at a soccer tournament, he might be a little bit shocked to find out that nobody else is, is uh, suited up like he is. So the point is, we are reading a book that is 2,000 years old, plus, if you read the Old Testament, written to people with an Eastern mindset, a Hebrew mindset, using a language that is not our own. Now, if we have to be careful in conversing with English, with people that even live within this country, concerning something so simple as a sporting event, how much more careful should we be when we read passages and words and phrases in God's Word. We shouldn't jump to conclusion that they're playing football our way. We might have to consider that Jesus and his disciples maybe played football or soccer and not American football. That's just an illustration to say we need to be careful when we read these passages. So the, this passage we're going to study today isn't difficult in that the words within it are hard to comprehend or understand, or even that the themes in it are hard or, or difficult to understand. But the difficulty lies within our, and just the, the word that's used, our ignorance of Old Testament symbolism and, and usage. Now, the original audience would have no problem comprehending this, and yet we do because we have more of a Western mindset. Not only that, but this has been a problem that's persisted since around about the 2nd or 3rd century. Because once the 2nd or 3rd century came about, the, the most of those people that wrote all these books about the Bible way back then, not writing the books of the Bible, but writing books about the Bible, come from a more Hellenistic or Grecian or a Western mindset as opposed to an Eastern mindset. And so very back in the very beginnings, when you read about these men, names such as uh, Irenaeus, and uh, Eusebius and these other guys, they are writing oftentimes from a more Grecian mindset than a Hebrew mindset. And automatically you see a lot of things are off. And so 
when we read this passage we're going to read uh, today, we need to be sure to put it in the proper context. And we're going to work hard to, to make sure that it's in that context. So in order to set this up, we're going to go to particular, uh, particular sections of Scripture to get these thoughts and imagery in our head. First off, we're going to go to the book of Isaiah, a passage that you're probably already familiar with, uh, but chapter 13. Isaiah chapter 13, to notice how language in the Bible is used. We, some people talk about interpreting the Bible literally. And a lot, a lot of times what they mean by that is that as you read the words, uh, you interpret them as they, as they are, appear. So when Isaiah 13 talks about the heavens and the earth passing away and all these uh, calamities taking place, excuse me, uh, they often attribute those to the end of the physical universe. But what literal Bible reading really is, is when you read it and you take the words at face value, but the face value you understand changes depending on the type of context what it's in. If it's in a prophetic or an apocalyptic context, the face value isn't the same face value that we experience of these words in the 21st century. You see? The face value isn't how we take it at face value, but how they would take it as face value. You don't read a poem and read it like a history book. All right? So we have to read these things in their proper context. Let's notice Isaiah 13. Begin in verse 1. The oracle concerning Babylon, which Isaiah the son of Amoz saw. So this passage is about Babylon. Babylon was in charge, they were over the Jews, from about 606 B.C., 606 years before Christ, up until about 536 B.C., whenever Nebuchadnezzar's grandson got overrun by the, uh, by the Medes and the Persians. But, so this is this nation that he's talking about. Now, let's, we're going to go down a little bit uh, in this passage, and we're going to begin reading in verse 6. All right, now this is still talking about the same people, Babylon, a nation that fell 536 B.C. He says, Well, for the day of the Lord is near. It will come as destruction from the Almighty. Therefore, all hands will fall limp, Every man's heart will melt. They'll be terrified. Pains and anguish will take hold of them. They will writhe like a woman in labor. Hold on a minute. You remember that rope I gave you? Here's another notch in it. See how this language is used in connection to this calamity against uh, Babylon? About the, uh, the woman and the birth pangs, right? They will look at one another in astonishment. Their face is aflame. Verse 9. Behold, the day of the Lord is coming, cruel with fury and burning anger, to make the land a desolation. He will exterminate its sinners from it. For the stars of heaven and their constellations will not flash forth their light. The sun will be dark when it rises and the moon will not shed its light. Thus I will punish the world for its evil and the, iniquid, uh, and the wicked for their iniquity. I will also put an end to the arrogance of the proud and abase the haughtiness of the, tr- of the ruthless. I will make mortal man scarcer than pure gold and mankind uh, than the gold of Ophir. Therefore I will make the heavens tremble, and the earth will be shaken from its place at the fury of the Lord of hosts in the day of his burning anger. Now what's this talking about? I keep going down here. Look at verse 17. You ready? Behold, I'm going to stir up the Medes against them, who will not value silver or take pleasure in gold. Their bows will mow down the young men. They will not even have compassion on the fruit of the womb. So what's he talking about? Again, verse 19. Babylon, the beauty of the kingdoms, the glory of the Chaldeans' pride, will be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. This is talking about the fall of Babylon in 536 B.C. But notice the amazing, extravagant, hyperbolic language. It's kind of like the Super Bowl. It's the hyperbole. No, but the, uh, the hyperbolic language that's used here in Isaiah 13. The stars are going to stop shining. The moon's going to be darkened. The sun's going to not give its light. The heavens and the earth are going to be shaken and moved out of their place. All the haughty are going to be brought down and all, the, all those that are humble are going to be lifted up. And All these things, wonderful, terrible, amazing things are going to happen. But it's all extravagant language used to describe the fall of a nation. Notice also he says there that it's going to be like the days of Sodom and Gomorrah in verse 19. That's really important, and we're not going to get to it just yet, but I want you to just sort of 
Pin that in the back of your mind. Remember that, Sodom and Gomorrah. There's, it's going to be like Sodom and Gomorrah. I want to show to you some other passages, though. These aren't the only ones. Look at Isaiah chapter 19, uh, for instance. And I've got other, some other books I want to go look at as well. This is the language that these people read in the synagogues every, every Sabbath day. Some of them, multiple times in a week, would, would come together and read these passages. Isaiah 19, verse 1. The oracle, now this is not Babylon, it said this is Egypt, concerning Egypt. Behold, the Lord is riding on a swift cloud and is about to come to Egypt. The idols of Egypt will tremble at his presence. The heart of the Egyptians will melt within them. So I will incite Egyptian against Egyptians, and they will each fight against his brother and each against his neighbor, city against city and kingdom against kingdom. All right, think about that. The Lord is going to ride on a swift cloud. Does this mean that you should picture a man with a white robe and a big white beard hopping on a cumulus cloud? He's got some reins and he's heon all the way to all the way down to Egypt. No, but this is symbolic, prophetic language to tell the Egyptians, "Hey, you're going to be destroyed, and you're going to have civil war and fights among yourselves and consume yourselves." But that's not your doing; that's the Lord's doing. All right, God is going to punish them in this way, and He uses this symbolism to illustrate this fact. Let's keep going in our New Testament. So this time, what I want to do is go to the book of Nahum. Now Nahum, that's one of those prophets that you'll just skip over it if you're not careful, you know, because it's just a few pages long. But if you remember, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum. And so once you get to Micah, you should know that Nahum is at hand. Nahum comes after Micah. Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk. All right, so Nahum, page 1,313. Ah, 1,195, I've been corrected. Okay, uh, Nahum chapter 1. Let's begin. The Oracle of Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, the Elkishite. A jealous and avenging God is the Lord. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries. He reserves, for, he reserves wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power. The Lord will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. In whirlwind and storm uh, is his way. The clouds are the dust beneath his feet. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry. He dries up all the rivers. Bashan and Carmel wither. The blossoms of Lebanon wither. Mountains quake because of him. And the hills dissolve. Indeed, the earth is upheaved upheaved by his presence. The world and all its inhabitants, uh, he says, the world and all its inhabitants in it. Now, what's this concerning? Look back at chapter 1, verse 1. The oracle of Nineveh. What's going to happen when Nineveh is destroyed? Nineveh being destroyed uh, by the Babylonians. What's going to happen to them? Well, they're going to be, the hills are going to melt. The earth is going to move out of its place. The rivers are going to dry up. All these terrible, wonderful, amazing things are going to take place at the day of the wrath of God. Now, the point of this is to illustrate to you the type of language that the Hebrews were familiar with when it came to God addressing the destruction of a city or a kingdom or a nation. This language is often employed to paint a picture of a mighty nation coming to its end. The heavens and earth are going to pass away. The hills are going to melt. The earth is going to be burned. The waters are going to be dried up. The mountains are going to move out of their place. All these just catastrophic decreation type of language. Now, if you just pick this up and you read it from an American football point of view instead of a a soccer point of view, you're going to be expecting to see all kinds of, you know, the trees on fire and the stars. Here comes, you know, uh, Jupiter flying out of the sky towards the earth and all these terrible things are going to take place. Pla- airplanes flying out of the sky, you know, all your cell phones stop working. Oh, no, that's, <laughs> that's the true sign of the apocalypse there. We've got to watch out for that one. No, but seriously, this is the way that people think when they read their Bibles because they're reading it from a 21st century Grecian Hellenistic perspective instead of, the, the perspective that the Bible's written in. That's a Hebrew perspective. In fact, the only writer in the entire Bible that may be a Gentile 
is Luke. In the Old Testament, it may be Job. But even there's debate about whether Luke was a Gentile or a Jew, or if Job was a pre-Moses or post-Moses. There's a lot of debates about that. But the point is, is that the Bible is for the most part written, overwhelmingly so, from a Hebraic point of view. All right? And these are some of the passages that are in the backdrop of Scripture. I want to show you one last one. Ezekiel, Daniel, Joel, let's see. (laughs) Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah. We want to go to Obadiah. Joel, Amos, Obadiah. And that's another one of those books that's so small, if if you're not careful, you'll skip it over in one turn. Obadiah. Okay, let's see. Obadiah chapter 1. I want you to notice what this is about. The vision of Obadiah, chapter 1, verse 1. Thus says the Lord God concerning Edom. Concerning Edom. All right, and this entire statement here, uh, this entire book is about Eden. For example, look at verse 6. Oh, how Esau will be ransacked, and his hidden treasure searched out. All the men allied with you will send you forth to the border, and the men at peace with you will deceive you and overpower you. They who eat your bread, they'll set an ambush for you. There is no understanding in them. Will I not in that day, declares the Lord, destroy wise men from Edom? and understanding from the mountain of Esau. There your mighty men will be dismayed, O Timon, so that every one may be cut off from the mountain of Esau by slaughter. Because of violence to your brother Jacob, you will be covered with shame, and you will be cut off forever. Now this is the, again, this is talking about the destruction of Edom. Look at verse 14. Do not stand at the fork of the road to cut down their fugitives and do not imprison their survivors in the day of their distress. For the day of the Lord draws near on all the nations as you have done. It will be done to you. Your dealings will return to your own head. Because you drank at my holy mountain, all the nations will drink continually. They will drink and swallow and become uh, as, it, as if they never existed. And so again, he goes on and he talks about how this is about the destruction of Edom. It's about the destruction of the descendants of Esau. And what does he say this judgment is on? Verse 25, the, Lord, the day of the Lord draws near on all the nations. And so even when you read a phrase like all of the nations, you have to read it within the context that it's written in. What nations is he talking about here? He's talking about the nations associated with Edom. Even the word nations is used to talk about the nations of Israel, the different tribes of Israel. So these are not to say that America was judged way back when Edom was destroyed, or Russia was, was judged way back when Edom was destroyed, but the nations involved in that time, they were the ones that were judged for the way that they mistreated Edom. Again, this is just some of the backdrop of the language that's used in the Old Testament. Let's go now to our New Testament passage, the one that I first I told you about but didn't give you the name of. Matthew chapter 24 and verses 29 to 31. Now see how much easier it is to understand this text now that you have the the proper backdrop for it. All right? Matthew 24 beginning in verse 29. He says, But immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from the sky and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. All right, now calm down. That's not talking about the end of the physical universe. But it's talking about the same thing that Isaiah 13 and that Nahum chapter 1, Isaiah 19, uh, Obadiah talk about the destruction of a nation. This symbolism about the stars falling from heaven and the sun turning to darkness is common in the Old Testament prophets. And it's for this reason that Jesus employed it here to paint a picture of this, the fall of the temple that he introduced in this, in this chapter. You know, talking about the, uh, the, the stars and such as that, and the sun and the moon, do you know where that uh, imagery is first found in Scripture, as far as I know? I might be a little bit off on this, but if you recall, uh, way back in the book of Genesis, way back in the book of Genesis, there was a young man born, and he was given a coat of many uh, colors, and his name was Joseph. Now, Joseph had a dream uh, concerning his family. And this dream that he had did not make his family too excited 
one bit. Uh, and the dream was in, in Genesis chapter 37, if you go back and you look, uh, Genesis chapter 37, the dream was this, beginning in verse 9. Now he had still another dream, and related it to his brothers, and said, Lo, I have had still another dream, and behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars were bowing down to me. He related it to his father and to his brothers, and his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have had? Shall I and your mother and your brothers actually come to bow down ourselves before you to the ground? See that? They understood that way back here in... You know, close to, close to 2000 B.C., probably more like 1800 or so. Or let's see, 400 years in captivity, so it'd be actually really, yeah, about 2000. Uh, so here Joseph is telling them, telling them this dream about the sun, the moon, the stars bowing down before him. And they interpreted that to mean his, the, the family hierarchy. And so when you read about in Matthew 24 and Isaiah 13 and these other passages about the sun and the moon and the stars and all these things happening to them, it means it has to do with the hierarchy of that particular nation failing and falling and being destroyed and taken out of the way. The kings and the queens and the princesses of that nation. And the princes being moved out of the way, the rulers falling. And so Jesus employs this language in Matthew twenty four twenty nine, which is, you know, if you really want to write this out beside, uh, you would write out Joel chapter 2 and round about verse 31 is where this imagery is specifically taken from. Um, but Joel 2.31 is where this is taken from. But we're, we're going to go there in a moment for another reason. Okay, so we got the first verse, verse 29. Now verse 30. And the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. Then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. That sounds familiar too, right? Didn't we read about God doing that to Egypt? The Lord's going to ride on a swift cloud to Egypt? See, Jesus is employing that same language to demonstrate to them, whenever you see Jerusalem fall, know that it's not Rome. It's me. I'm the one that's brought this about. I'm the one that's caused this calamity because of their rejection of the prophets, the rejection of me, and their rejection of you. He's using the same Old Testament prophetic language to paint this picture. All right, verse 31. And he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet, And they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other. Now, this gathering together that's discussed here in Matthew 24, 31 has uh, roots of it in the New Testament. I think I mentioned to you this morning about how in Matthew chapter 3 and in Matthew chapter 13, Jesus and John the Baptist both talk about the gathering of the wheat into the Father's barn. In Matthew 3 and Matthew 13. This gathering here is equivalent to that. But particularly, if you look at the, at, the, at the time when this great trumpet would be blown and they would be gathered together, if, if you look in the Old Testament where this reference is found, you'll find it's found in Isaiah chapter 27. So let's take a look back in Isaiah 27 to get a better understanding of what Jesus is discussing. <coughs> of what Jesus is discussing, <coughs> discussing here. In Isaiah chapter 27, and verse 13. Alright? Let's read verse 12, because it's got something good for you there. In that day, the Lord will start His threshing from the flowing stream of the Euphrates to the brook of Egypt, and you will be gathered up one by one, O sons of Israel. It will come about also in that day that a great trumpet will be blown, And those who are perishing in the land of Assyria and who are scattered in the land of Egypt will come and worship the Lord in the holy mountain at Jerusalem. Now, there's a lot that you might not, uh, you might, a lot of background you might not have for this particular passage, so let me sort of supplement that for you. In the book of Isaiah, there are two Jerusalems that are discussed. There is a Jerusalem that the holy mountain is going to be established in, Isaiah chapter 2 and verses 1 and following. But there's also this Jerusalem that's talked about that's going to get what's coming to them. And so you have this picture of the two Jerusalems. And we understand that from the New Testament because you have the Jerusalem below in Galatians 4 and you have the Jerusalem above. You have the Jerusalem of the earth and the Jerusalem of of heaven above. And so 
in uh, Isaiah 27, notice he's, he's talking about this Jerusalem above, this holy mountain that would be established, the kingdom of God. But notice what this is related to, this gathering. This gathering is related to the uh, nation of Israel and the regathering of Israel. Now, I know that we've talked about this before, but what Jesus is telling them in Matthew 24 is that what's going to happen is I'm going to gather true Israel unto myself when these other people are being destroyed. And he would gather them into the kingdom, into the church, into fellowship with him. And we don't have time to to develop that theme anymore, but I just want you to notice that the Old Testament context of Matthew 24, 31 is Isaiah 27, 13. And if you go and you read, if you keep reading back until you don't see any more in that days, you'll come to Isaiah 25. And you'll find that this entire three chapters is an entire context dealing with the same time that Jesus is dealing with. And I would encourage you to read those three chapters uh, on your own time. Now finally, what I want to do is... I've got two finalies that I want to do. And then we'll be, do- we'll be done. The first finally is found in Matthew chapter 25. Okay? But to set the background for you, I need you to open up to Matthew 25, but I also want you to open up to Joel chapters 2 and 3. Alright, so Matthew 25, and then hold a place between Joel 2 and 3. If you got a, if you have a gadget, that's hard, harder to do, but uh, you, can, you can swipe pretty fast. Now Joel chapter 2 and 3, I want to read this to you, and I'm going to read to you a passage from Matthew 25. All right, begin in verse 30. I'll display wonders in the sky and on the earth. Joel 2 and verse 30. Joel 2 and verse 30. I'll display wonders in the sky and on the earth. Blood, fire, columns of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness. The moon and the blood. Before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And it will come about that whoever calls uh, on the name of the Lord will be delivered. From Mount Zion and in Jerusalem. Hey, look, Mount Zion, Jerusalem. That's the same thing talked about there in Isaiah 27. This is the kingdom of God. This is the church. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there will be those who escape, as the Lord has said, even among the survivors whom the Lord calls. For behold, chapter 3, verse 1, in those days and at that time. What days? In the last days. What time? The day of the Lord. This is the same kind of thing in Luke 17 that we talked about in Bible class. The days leading up to the day of the Son of Man and the day of the Son of Man. In those days and at that time, in the last days and at the day of the Lord, will I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem. Again, that's talking about what happened there in uh, Isaiah 27. The great trumpet blows and the people of Israel are gathered back to God. I will gather all the nations, verse 2, and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. Then I'll enter into judgment with them there on behalf of my people and my inheritance Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations, and they divided up my land. So what's going to happen on, in these days and at that time? The nations are going to be gathered together to judge. Now that sounds familiar to us from Obadiah, right? That's what happened in the days of Edom as well, in a sense. But that being said, I told you to open up to Matthew 25 for a reason. Let me show you. Matthew 25, verse 31 through 33. But when the Son of Man comes, Matthew 25, 31 through 33. But when the Son of Man comes in His glory, well, we know that's the same thing as Matthew 24, 30. There's the Son of Man coming in His glory. Here's the Son of Man coming in His glory. But when the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, in Matthew 24, 31, He sends His angels to gather the people. So here He is again, coming to gather the nations with His angels. He will sit on His glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He'll put the sheep on his right and the goats on the left. Now what is the difference between that and Joel chapter 2 and 3? It's talking about the same thing. It's talking about the same thing that Matthew 24, 29 to 31 is talking about. That is the calamity of Jerusalem, the end of that nation, and the establishment um, of the kingdom and the restoration of Israel. Now I want to show you one more passage. And I'm not going to explain this passage to you. I'm just going to read it to you. And then you're going to know what it's talking about just from what you've already discussed. Go to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. Now you already have the background for this. On your, your first century Hebrew glasses, remember what you read from Isaiah. 
Remember what you just heard from Jesus. All right, now this is one who was sitting there at Jesus' feet while Jesus taught this. Actually, he was probably standing and Jesus was sitting. That's they had it, sort of had it reversed. The teacher had it a lot better back then. The teacher got to sit down and everybody else had to stand up. But we, we felt sorry for you all having to stand up, so we figured we'd do it. <laughs> That's why Gary runs every morning, so he can stand up for you. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, let's begin here reading in verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night, or like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burned up. Now again, what's different between that and what we just read in Isaiah, Joel, Matthew 24, Nahum chapter 1, the earth heaving out of its place, the hills melting, the rivers drying up? Let's keep going. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hasting the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat? But according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. So what's he saying? He's saying there's a system that exists now, a kingdom that exists now, and that's going to be destroyed. The stars are going to fall, the heavens are going to be shaken, it's going to be moved out of its place, and he's going to set up a new one, a new nation, a new people. One more finally, is that okay? Last one. Let me show you the, 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 what this is talking about. One nation taken away, another nation coming in. Last passage, I promise, Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21, this is, this is it. If heavens and earth and sun and moon and stars and all those things Then notice what Matthew 24, 21 is is saying. All right? 21 and verse 43. Matthew 21, verse 43. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you. Let me insert this. Your sun's going to go dark. Your moon's going to turn to blood. Your stars are going to fall from heaven. You're going to shake. You're going to be moved out of your place. You're going to burn up. The kingdom of God is going to be taken away from you and given to a people producing the fruit of it. In other words, your heavens and earth are going to be destroyed, and I'm going to set up a new one. Like Just like this. Babylon's heavens and earth were destroyed, and the Medes and the Persians' heaven and earth were created. Jerusalem's heaven and earth was destroyed, and the church's heaven and earth was established. The nation was taken away from them, and given to a people willing to bear its fruits. You see, these passages, 2 Peter 3, Matthew 24... All of Revelation are considered to be difficult texts. But if we put on our Hebrew glasses, remember what the Old Testament said about these things and how that language was used, and remember that God uses language consistently, then these passages that were once kind of fuzzy can become 2020 once we get on our Hebrew glasses. All right? That being said, just take a step back from all this, look at it all. That's a lot of information, but think about it this way. How wonderful and amazing the Word of God is. How wonderful God is to be able to execute judgment and to give us a kingdom ruled by Jesus that will never pass away. He did all this for you. We can talk about the technical details of the language and all that, and that's fun for me to talk about. But the big picture is this. God has done all this for you. He sent Jesus to die for you. And no matter how you perceive some of, this, some of the way that this language is used, the important part is, is that God has done it for you. Now the question that ask yourself is, are you willing to be a part of his family? Are you willing to be a part of this kingdom? It's an amazing thing that God has done, but it would be a very shameful thing if we neglect what he's done for us. So if you're here today and you've yet become a Christian, We've talked about that before. You know what you need to do. Or if you have become a Christian, but you need prayers in your life, you can make that known to us at this time, and we will uh, do whatever we can to help you. Anybody need uh, help in that way? All right. In that case, we thank you all so much here today. Remember to keep everybody in your prayers. Thank you, Jaden. Remember to keep everybody in your prayers that was uh, mentioned at the, uh, start of the, at the start of the services today. Um, and remember all of us in your prayers that we'll all you know, keep on the straight and narrow path and uh, do what we can to serve God each and every day, right?